Hello and welcome to the Erlang Solutions monthly webinar. My name is Vladimir Milicic and I'm the VP for the EMEA region here at Erlang Solutions. Today's webinar represents a continuation of a series of webinars we have been running uh, across topics of interest in the world of Erlang and dealing with solutions based on the Erlang programming language. Specifically today we will be hearing a bit about the work INACA, Erlang Solutions is mobile development arm undertook with SCORE Sports, a social network focused on sport and connecting over 2,000 athletes with their uh, fan base. By nature of its user base and the way its application is predominantly used, SCORE Sports have realized very early on just how critical mobile platforms are for the experience and the content that they wish to convey uh, to their user base. Uh, Erlang Solutions and Inaka consequently engaged with SCORE on application feature development as well as furthering the scalability of its platform. Now, as with any live event, do excuse any technical issues that we may face today, but to start by telling you a bit about Erlang Solutions, we are a product and services orientated company completely devoted to the Erlang programming language. We work with organizations and individuals using Erlang, uh, helping evolve the language and supporting people and businesses using it. Uh, our office, uh, offices across the world are firstly in London where we are headquartered, then in Stockholm, Krakow, Budapest, San Francisco and Buenos Aires. We work on projects uh, spanning industries and the globe. We also develop Erlang-based products, and uh, some of those include our Mongoose IM messaging platform, the React distributed database, and Wombat OAM, our monitoring and management technology. Now, I'm very pleased to say our speakers today are SCORE Sports project lead, Chuck Pinkert, and the Inaka senior project manager, Tatiana Udin. Please allow me to finish by saying you are most welcome to pose questions throughout the duration of the webinar by using the chat facility on the webinar's interface. Our speakers, Chuck and Tatiana, will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of, end of the webinar. But should any questions go unanswered, you are most welcome to raise them via email using the following address, webinar at erlang-solutions.com. If you are interested beyond the webinar, in learning a bit more about Erlang or wish to establish whether it could be a solution for the challenges your own business may be facing, then please feel free to contact me directly. My email address will be displayed in one of the final slides of this presentation. I would now like to hand over to Tatiana and Chuck, who will be glad to start us off. Hi, I'm Tatiana Udin. I'm a project manager at Inaka and I've been with the company for three years. Um, so <laughs> to give some context to those who aren't familiar with us, uh, we were founded in 2011 and we merged with Erlang Solutions in 2014. Uh, we're based in uh, Buenos Aires and we work with developers across South America and uh, we specialize in end-to-end -end solutions across different platforms. Yeah, and hi, I'm Chuck Pinkert. I'm the uh, lead mobile developer here at SCORE Sports. Uh, you may or may not have heard of SCORE Sports. It's a startup based here in San Francisco. Uh, we are a Bay Area company. Uh, let's see, uh, if we could advance to the next slide. Uh, we have a uh, development team of about 30 people. Uh, the company has grown to around 75 to 80 people. Our main presences are on iOS, Android, and web. Uh, we have millions of users, and uh, we're expanding in Europe. Uh, the, the quick spiel on what Score Sports is is that it's bringing together uh, athletes and fans. So the idea is that uh, we have things like private chats, which we'll talk about today, where uh, users can meet their favorite athletes and talk in a semi-private room. And we really just want to lower the bar of entry to having people be able to uh, talk to their athletes and uh, 
anyone in sports really. So, uh, so far it's been a lot of fun to do. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started on the rest of the presentation. So we, we've broken down this talk into four parts, starting with the project itself, where we'll go through some, tech, some of the technical details and logistics of building a chat feature. Then we'll go through the tools we use to stay organized, uh, followed by how we created a team environment, and finally some of the challenges uh, we encountered along the way. Uh, some technical difficulties, apologies. Um. Yeah, so while we wait for the next slide to advance, uh, the, the project that we uh, were given uh, in the middle of last year, I believe it was, was to uh, bring a chat application or chat feature to our application. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it would scale uh, to, to millions of users. Uh, here's the great slide. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, we were brought in to help score fortify their iOS app and build their Android app, basically giving them the resources they needed to take their product to the next level. And one of the most important features they wanted to add was a unique chat feature that would set them apart from any of their competitors. Yeah, exactly. That. Now kind of go into the technical details. Uh, of what that all means now. Um, this is kind of a preview of what's to come in the talk. I'm going to talk about some of the technical issues that went on with each one of these, uh, one of these tasks, including uh, having an iOS client, obviously, that can talk to uh, our chat server and, and do all the fun chat things we wanted to do, an Android client as well. And uh, you'll see a few times XMPP mentioned. That is the protocol that we use for chat. It is also the protocol that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, Facebook Messenger, uh, Slack, so many uh, of the big chat apps, WhatsApp, all use the same uh, protocol. So there are some kind of pre-built libraries we uh, started from for Android and iOS. Uh, but then we also had a, a kind of a very specialized UI we wanted to do that was uh, specific to sports. So we'll go into that more in a little bit. Uh, finally, we uh, also <clears throat> implemented a version of XMPP that is uh, a little different than the standard flavor so that it would work better on mobile solutions. So we're going to go to the next slide, which is the beautiful map that Tatiana just showed. Uh, one of our biggest challenges and one of our biggest benefits, and something we'll harp on a lot today, is that uh, we had teams all over the world in different time zones. We had at SCORE uh, we had partial mobile team, which was me and another dev or two, a, uh, the project lead, myself as well, and uh, the back end team in Argentina, there in Buenos Aires, you see a NACA on the map. That was the majority of our iOS and Android. At the time, we uh, needed a feature soon, and we didn't have the mobile power to do it, so we uh, enlisted a NACA, and uh, as you'll see, it was a great deal. Uh, we then went to also have a single XMPP resource uh, who you could uh, pretty much see as the chat server uh, professional in Stockholm. If you could advance to the next slide. Uh, so the, this is just showing the difference in times. Uh, it's a uh, four-hour difference to Buenos Aires from my time here in San Francisco and uh, almost a complete 24 hours to Stockholm. So we had plenty of meetings with people uh, who were about to eat dinner or who were just waking up. So it, to give some context, we were getting to the office. Argentina was finishing up lunch, and guys in Europe were having dinner. Uh, so there was a little, bit of, um, a little bit of compromise that had to be made on both sides. For instance, I had to wake up early and do some question answering and unblocking devs early. And uh, some of the guys in uh, Stockholm would have to uh, step out of their dinner arrangements to get on calls occasionally. But everybody was actually very good to work with. Uh, it was uh, such a team effort that people were excited to, to jump in. And they've been waiting to talk to people for people to wake up to figure things out. So that's good. 
uh, one of the biggest things about the whole time zone thing, and I'll go into the pros and cons of it a lot, but uh, I can't explain how great of a feeling it is to show up at work at uh, 8 or 9 a.m. and have uh, the Anaka team, an Android and mobile team that has completely uh, done half their day and pushed great features and code. So I remember the first day I showed up, I thought, yes, I can handle this. This will work out well. Um, so let's go ahead and slide on to the next slide. Okay, so this is uh, talking about some of the technologies we actually used, and this is going to get a little more uh, technical. Uh, so bear with me if you're not technical. I am a Android and iOS developer at heart, so uh, if I talk like an engineer, there you go. You now you know why. Uh, our iOS app is completely written in Swift, uh, and we use the XMPP framework library to, uh, to talk with the chat server. So basically what that means is we had a good chunk of work already done for us to start with. Um, unfortunately, this framework, anytime you use a third-party library, you never know what you're going to get. Uh, <laughs> they will take care of a lot of features, but you'll find plenty of things that wish you would do a different way. But it turns out it worked out really well. Uh, we ended up having to write a lot of custom code to handle uh, our special type of group chat called Muck Lite. Uh, finally, maybe this is more detailed than you need, but all of our async operations were mod modeled in uh, NS operations. So basically what that means is that we can, uh, we can fire off requests to our server and prioritize them. So if you're entering a chat room, that should get first priority. All of the network calls should come in from that. Uh, you can cancel them. Uh, you can queue them up. All kinds of fun stuff that uh, everyday users need to know for or need to have for their apps. Uh, and what's really great about this is that that is not a standard iOS developer feature that most developers know. One second, box. Um, I'll wait for it to come. Uh, but Anaka did such a wonderful job of learning that and then helping train us up in it. Uh, they seem to have a lot of uh, expertise in this area due to their uh, close relationship with Erlang. Uh, so that was tremendously helpful. Uh, and then let's go ahead and jump to Android. Uh, Android was a little bit different. It was not only chat feature, but rewriting the entire app. Um, so that was really important to us that we got a really good structure started on that, uh, a very good foundation. I'm very proud of what we've uh, uh, accomplished there. And uh, one of the reasons it, it did as well as it did is we used a, a library called RxJava which is uh, a library that uses a, something called functional reactive programming. So what this does is it helps us uh, do the same thing that NS operations was doing on iOS. It helps us handle all of these chat requests from thousands of users uh, on the client and show them at the right time. Uh, it, once again, that is a high learning curve. It is something that only advanced or senior developers normally uh, have any experience with. And uh, the lead Android developer at Anaka actually uh, trained our two junior developers to understand and know that. It's actually the biggest success of our story from a development perspective, in my opinion, is the great mentorship and teamwork that was shown on the uh, Android application uh, to teach a very difficult topic uh, re remotely. And we also did some in-person training, so that was extremely helpful. And then they also used a library called Smack. XMPP, uh, which is similar to XMPP framework, but uh, a little more uh, mature uh, of a library. Finally, we used uh, Erlang on our end to do uh, game event parsing. So I uh, haven't yet explained what the app does, so I'll kind of follow back or what that means. I'll follow back up with that here on the next slide because it has a nice screenshot and we'll be able to explain that. And then finally, the XMPP feature was Mongoose IM with uh, some custom modules. Once again, I'll explain that on the next screen. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll explain those as much as I can here as we jump on. So uh, if you could, this is a good way to explain exactly what we did, uh, just looking at a screenshot of what a chat room looks like. Of course, it looks like a normal chat room. I think most people would understand what's happening as far as the conversation goes. But the key feature for us was being able to add teams to a chat room. And so what that means is you add your favorite team, 
And whenever the game is going on, you get notifications inside of the app that says, uh, you know, somebody scored a goal or that there was a touchdown. Uh, the idea is that we bring all of the things that you need to have for a sports conversation uh, into the chat room. So uh, as you can see on the right, some people are talking and uh, a touchdown happens, somebody uh, is celebrating and then uh, another item happens. And now as all this is happening, a, uh, a score at the top and a time indicator are showing uh, how much time is left in the game and what the score is. So this was a key feature we wanted to do. Uh, and it was the, the, the thrust of a good three or four months of effort. Uh, so I'll go ahead and explain the, the server parts that, that led to that. Um, we actually receive real-time updates as the game is happening within a second or two of it happening. We used to get that touchdown event. And then we have to take all of that XML and parse it and turn it into something we can handle, uh, which was not a small task. Uh, that was um, all done in Erlang. Once we get that done, we convert that into something that's consumable for our client, a sentence like so, uh, Carlos Hyde runs for a 10 yard touchdown in the example. Uh, we do everything we need to do to present it for the client and then we send it to chat rooms. And the way we send it to chat rooms is uh, a really neat little um, custom feature that we wrote that is based on PubSub, which is publisher subscriber uh, architecture, which means each one of these chat rooms they're just listening to the 49ers uh, publisher that's sending out information. So um, uh, you'll, you'll see here that that's what happens. So we, we basically put up a package and we throw it to the XMPP server for everybody that's following the 49ers and they get a chat in their room, which is, uh, which is a lot of fun. Uh, some of the things that goes into the chat currently are real-time events, uh, like game events, half has started, half has ended, the game's about to begin scoring events, penalties, uh, really the opportunities are endless. Uh, we could put uh, substitutions, we could put highlight videos. Uh, it's a really exciting thing to do. Uh, finally, it is chat, so push notifications and handling the disconnected state are extremely important. And Mongoose IM has that all built in. And so we did some push notifications uh, with a little bit of filtering to make sure that somebody doesn't get a duplicate push notification. Uh, so I just want to give you an idea of what our daily schedule looks like. Uh, at 5 a.m., uh, Anaka is starting and they're writing Android and iOS code. And this is fabulous for us because it means, like I said, you wake up and everything's uh, going. Uh, one of the things that we had to adjust to to make this work was uh, at the end of my day, the day before, I needed to make sure that uh, Anaka uh, the mobile teams and our XMPP resource in Stockholm had their next day ready to go before I left. So uh, one of the main themes of our success, I think, was being able to uh, it was being able to plan ahead. I guess it's a uh, it magnifies the time difference, magnifies any kind of inefficiencies you have. Uh, being able to just answer questions and not have it in a ticket system, for example. Uh, is not always possible since half the team is sleeping while the other half is working. Uh, and whenever somebody says, drop everything you're doing, I need you to do this, you really can't. You need to spend five minutes to make sure that um, everybody who's going to be queued up and starting soon is ready to go. So that's one thing that we, we learned and I think we're doing a lot better at today. Uh, so 5 a.m. they start. 10 a.m. we have a daily stand-up, which is extremely important. Uh, the, the communication for remote workers, even if you don't have anything to say, it feels like you just need to open it, send a message, and, and make, uh, make it easy for everybody. So the daily stand-up is wherever the team kind of has our bonding time. It's a little less uh, like a usual stand-up where everyone's trying to get in and get out because it's the only time that we have together to talk. So uh, we really see it as a teamwork and team building exercise as well. Finally, at 3 p.m., the Inaka devs leave for the day and uh, we're planning what to do the next day. So uh, Tatiana's going to go ahead and talk about all the tools we use to try to keep this together. It's really nothing fancy. It's pretty much the stuff you'd expect, I think, uh, or maybe not. Maybe it'll be insightful. Um, 
I'll let her take over from here. All right. Yeah, so there's nothing particularly earth shattering about the tools we use or how we stay organized, but I know it's a question that's often asked, so I thought we'd break it down and demystify uh, remote teamwork. So um, as Chuck mentioned, the daily stand-up, we have a daily stand-up with the entire mobile team, and that's where everyone gets out um, onto a Google Hangout and discusses what they've been working on. Uh, there are four points that every dev should mention, which is, what are you working on? How long is it going to take to finish? What are you planning on taking next? And what key files are you working on? Do you have any blockers, any questions? And this is a really important time for the project lead to hear about everyone's progress, um, make sure that everyone has enough tasks to keep them busy for the day, and to see if the sprint needs to be adjusted. But it's also important for everyone on the team to hear what the other guys are working on. It uh, creates a certain amount of cohesiveness in the work that's being done. Um, since the stand-up happens in the morning for SCORE and during our afternoon, we also have an internal Inaka daily where we basically do the same status update when we get into the office so the guys can touch base. Um, there's no point in having uh, waiting four hours to uh, talk about outstanding issues or, or blockers. Um, if you have the option, get everyone, up, get everyone on a call. Um, written statuses work every once in a while, but especially when you're working with a remote team, it's important to directly connect. And um, we try to keep it short. Most of our stand-ups are around 10 to 15 minutes. And then um, we use Slack, uh, which is a popular uh, chat tool. Uh, SCORE was actually already using this uh, when we started. One of the key differences um, that we made was when we joined the team was making sure the guys discuss things in the Slack channel even if they're in the same room. And that ensures that you're including the remote people but also to make sure that you have a record of what was discussed. Often everyone agrees on a certain decision, then, then five minutes later they're trying to recall the specifics and things can get hairy. Um, something that our devs also found useful was being able to ping score server devs immediately when they had an issue and sometimes that would mean they'd wake up to that, but there's, there's no lag, you didn't have to wait. Um, make sure to take advantage of the time that everyone's online during the day. Uh, the mobile team was in constant communication as Chuck mentioned, so um, after that daily and in a lot of times before, uh, you get everyone on board and chatting. So um, JIRA is a project management tool that we use to assign uh, and organize tasks. SCORE was already using it before we started working with them, but when we joined it caused them to get a lot more organized, and making sure that there were descriptions and details added to tasks so they were specific enough for our guys to work on without asking questions every five minutes. Um, so if you can't define a, a list of requirements or add details about a task, it's not ready to be assigned to anyone. And that's something, that's something that um, should be a rule for any team anywhere. Uh, I know it's really tempting when you have a new feature or a tight deadline to just get started. But in my experience, you end up running into a lot more problems if you don't invest the time in outlining the requirements of a feature, creating thoughtful tasks, and thinking about all the parts that in, are involved. Uh, you set yourself up to run into a lot of blockers and big refactors or even just throwing out code because you rush to get something started. Now this, of course, isn't particular to working with a remote team, but the consequences are compounded when half your team is across the world and has a four-hour head start on you. And the added benefit is the more thorough a task is, the better estimates your devs can make and the more accurate your sprints will be. And we've also asked the guys in their stand-ups to include the JIRA ticket in their status so that you can see if the JIRA board corresponds. So um, another thing we do is pull requests. Uh, this is something that is standard practice at Inaka that we kind of brought with us to score. And um, Chuck uh, has specific comments regarding that. Yeah, 
uh, one of the great things that uh, we, we've started to do on, on the mobile team, I think, uh, and I refer to us as the mobile team because I really feel like my, my Anaka devs are the same as my, my team devs. I think that's been uh, something that we all enjoy. But uh, something that we've started to do is really get a conversation going in our pull request. It's important since we're all remote that every uh, pull request that's reviewed has comments on it. Uh, it's also a way of sharing knowledge between uh, two different developers. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with pull requests, Basically, it is a developer has written an entire chunk of code, and they're sending it to another to say, uh, is this good enough to go? Um, and so they can discuss what they went well, what didn't went well, what they should maybe change. Or um, a lot of times, it's just uh, the other developers even learning about how that feature works so that more than one person knows about it. So uh, this is extremely important, probably the most important piece on the engineering side for us to, um, to stay on the same page. Uh, because as engineers, we could talk about how a feature works forever, but if you actually see the code, then uh, the communication really is a lot easier. Uh, finally, we also set up a new workflow for uh, pull requests and uh, how we're going to um, do code changes in the same place at the same time. So um, avoiding merge issues is a big deal because it's harder to resolve merges when one of the devs is not there or one of the engineers is not there. Um, so at our stand-up, a lot of times, uh, my role is to make sure that anyone who's working on the same part of the application, I know that the code is going to touch or they're going to impact each other, uh, to call that out and make sure that they work together throughout the day and there's no surprises when it comes to merge time. And then we did one more thing. We, uh, uh, if for special details uh, or for extra detail, we, Anaka has their own fork uh, so they can actually make any changes they want and own that and make pull requests into our uh, main repository, which is really helpful to keep uh, keep things separated permissions-wise. But uh, we'll go ahead and jump to Google Calendar, and I'll let uh, Tatiana talk about that. So uh, Google Calendar, there's nothing particularly innovative here, but like a soccer mom with a van full of kids, remembering everyone's schedule can be a challenge. And Chuck and I share a calendar called Score Ninaka Scheduling. Uh, or I update the schedules for devs, whether that be for vacation, a doctor's appointment, uh, et cetera. Um, since we're operating in different countries, it's also important to add things like federal holidays and office schedules. And those are things that most people tend to forget. Uh, this is also the place where uh, I put um, if a dev is sick or unavailable the day of. So when Chuck gets into the office, he has an idea of what's going on with his team. So um, our mobile team has a pretty t uh, tight-knit group. Um, and uh, over the duration of this project, there's certain factors that we think have contributed to that. Uh, something I've noticed that Chuck has done really well is giving the guys feedback on a daily basis. Um, letting them know collectively and individually that he appreciates the work they're doing uh, when they deliver a task or come up with a solution to a problem or finish a sprint. Um, Chuck will commend them for a job well done and I can tell the guys really appreciate it and it makes a difference. I think sometimes making a client happy can feel impersonal but I've seen how the guys have become invested in the project and in the team and they want to impress Chuck and they don't want to let him down, and I think he's done a great job to foster that uh, camaraderie. I don't know if you have anything else to add about uh, your <laughs> mentality and in, in giving people shout outs. Yeah, absolutely. Just as my time as developer, I know that uh, you work a long time on a feature, and uh, the, as soon as you finish, the next feature is ready to go. So uh, we like to take pause at least for a second and say thank you and, uh, and continue on to the next thing because there's plenty of things to do. Uh, another thing we did uh, was uh, kind of face-to-face -face interaction. So one of our iOS devs, uh, Aminako went to SF. 
I, am I getting feedback? Or is it just you? I think it's you sound good to me. Okay. Okay. Um, so sorry, so about sorry about that. Uh, one of our IO staffs from Inaco went to San Francisco for a month uh, early in, on in the project, and then two junior devs from SCORE came to BA for a few months. Uh, and their devs were able to learn a lot faster working alongside our guys. And I think that exchange was also really important to create a connection among the developers. Uh, you know, you're online every day and you're checking each other's PRs, but it's great to know that there's a person behind that Git handle. Um, having that face-to-face -face interaction really does have an impact, um, especially in long-term projects. It's a great investment to have team members meet and work alongside one another. Yeah, and I'd like to add to this one uh, on the face-to-face. -face. We really got a lot of uh, a lot of value. We sent some very junior Android developers to uh, Argentina, and they came back trained up very well. Um, so as long as it helped tremendously with teamwork, but it really added value to our uh, organization to be able to uh, lean on those people more as they came back a lot stronger. And uh, finally, uh, another thing that I think contributed to our kind of team atmosphere is that right off the bat, I reached out to Chuck uh, to let him know that I needed his honest feedback in order to make sure that we were living up to his expectations. So unlike a lot of projects I work on, uh, I have very little to go on in terms of the quality of code our guys are delivering. Since we're embedded in SCORE's workflow, uh, we aren't part of the QA process, and many components and features are a collaborative effort. Um, I think you have to facilitate a certain level of trust and lay your cards out on the table in order to get the kind of feedback and transparency and, and confidence you need to keep the project going. So I check in every now and again, but um, at this point, I'm confident that if, there, if Chuck sees an issue or if something's off, he won't hesitate to share. And I think that has proved it handy when the, there were tense times in the project. Yeah, that, that's right. Now, I'll just add one more thing, and that is that um, I actually have a schedule in my calendar to uh, remind myself to send feedback to Tatiana, because it's easy to get wrapped up in a project and forget. So actually scheduling time to have honest feedback and, and collaboration is, is really helpful for me. Yeah, and so <laughs> going on to the last point, so this all sounds great, uh, but it's an ongoing process. We've had to improve on all of these points, and no project is perfect, and Things go wrong, so we thought we'd go over some missteps we encountered and how we tried to resolve them. Uh, one of the issues that uh, came up to mind was there was an issue with some endpoints, so the server guys in San Francisco made some changes and then went home for the day, and our mobile guys got into work, and what do you know, nothing worked. Basically, everyone was blocked until the server guys from San Francisco got back up to the office and were able to figure out what was going on. And this kind of lack of communication creates delays when everyone's in the same office, but it's really compounded when there's a four hour head start. Uh, so we tried to do two things to resolve this. One is if you're gonna work on an existing endpoint or change anything, you have to reach out. And the goal is uh, getting the guys to communicate before even you know anyone touches anything so that we can maybe plan accordingly if someone, someone's in the middle of trying to make a change. And then the second is to try to get the guys to stick to a workflow and create a merge schedule. It can be really tempting for a dev to merge everything before they leave the office, but you can see that it can totally sell a project. Um, another thing that we found was finding the right fit. So not every dev shines in certain situations or environments, and we had a dev that didn't do well with being embedded in a high stress environment with last minute requirement changes, which was basically while we were developing the chat feature, we were under an extremely tight deadline and product was changing things. And it, it wasn't ideal, obviously, the situation wasn't ideal, but he would often protest instead of trying to find solutions. And his attitude began to rub off on the rest of the team. And this, of course, isn't 
exclusive to working with people remotely, but it can sour a dynamic, especially one you have to foster very carefully when you're working with a remote team. And one of the ways that we resolved this was being honest with each other and identifying what was going on. We ended up reassigning that dev from the project, and I think it benefited everyone involved. Uh, making sure that there's a positive team environment allows for problem solving to take center stage during those tense moments rather than a doomsday mentality that can honestly be really infectious. Yeah, and I'll just add that uh, I think something that shows our great the communication that we built up is that it was not a surprise to either of us or anyone on the team uh, when we did when we talked about this kind of stuff. So uh, it's I think it's a good sign when you know what the other person is going to say uh, before they say it. So that's good. And then finally, uh, keeping team morale. Like I mentioned before, we had a really aggressive timeline with shifting requirements and a back end that was always behind. And that left our mobile devs blocked, frustrated, annoyed. Uh, and they didn't really see an end in sight. And one of the ways we neutralized tensions was meeting with the guys, hearing them out, and explaining what was going on with the other teams to put their issues into perspective. I think it's easy to have blinders on when you don't have what you need to do your work, and it's easy to forget that there are teams that have challenges of their own, especially when those issues aren't communicated to you. So it's important that the PM is not only aware of the issues, but also they communicate what's going on so the team has some perspective. Even if there's nothing you can do about it, uh, telling the team, for example, hey, you know, they had to redesign that screen because product didn't like it, uh, they want to avoid changing it later, they'll have it to you as soon as it's done. Or, you know, the back end guys, they don't want to break the admin, so they're they're gonna make that change, but it might take a while. That really makes a difference. You don't want to get into a situation where sentiments have been brewing unchecked and unanswered. It kind of leads to this desperation. Um, so if you feel like you're in control and, and if things aren't going your way, but there's a reason, it's a lot easier to to, you know, to stay calm. <laughs> yeah, and and I hope I hope this all brings to light that it's um, it, like any real project, <laughs> there are people involved, and it's it's a, as much a, a people management thing as it is a, a technical management thing. So um, I, I like to think that it's uh, it's really honest and, and real uh, uh, explanation of how 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 it all went down. So that's pretty much what we've prepared. Um, I know that you guys have probably been preparing some questions, so I'll let you guys take the lead on that. So firstly to say um, thank you very much for a most inspiring talk uh, to Chuck and Tatiana, and I'm sure the audience um, is joining me in that. Uh, I'd also like to thank the audience for um, a bit of an avalanche of uh, questions that they've been asking throughout the webinar. Um, I'm going to have to disappoint some of you and say that we can only answer so many in the remaining time, but we'll certainly do our best to answer as many as we can now. Any unanswered questions we will answer in writing, uh, sending the responses to people who ask them uh, after the webinar. So thank you again. I would suggest uh, we just dive in uh, straight into the questions. Uh, so Tatiana and uh, Chuck, uh, we have one of our members of the audience um, David asking, uh, how did you, to begin with, and you partially answered this, but how did you choose and why did you choose uh, an Erlang-based uh, uh, platform to begin with? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and answer that one. Uh, Erlang was important to us because uh, scalability. Um, we are expecting to have a lot of users uh, very soon. Uh, and, and we don't have any issues with scaling. Uh, we also have had a lot of experience with Erlang, so we're familiar with it. And finally, uh, it just seemed like the best chat product for us. So it was a good fit. So, Thank you for that. Um, we'll just go straight on to the next question to try and honor as many of them as we can. Um, this is a very concrete question coming from uh, Norman. So Norman is asking, uh, could you, in effect, tell us a bit about your typical traffic? So your messages per second at peak times, your 
concurrent users' uh, numbers at peak times, as well as your unique daily active users. Do you have any stats that you could share with us? That is a, a very good question. Uh, we see our peak uh, usage whenever we have a very large post go out. So a lot of times we'll have a, a professional athlete post something that is just really rallying up the internet. And uh, that seems to be when we see our most load. I do not have any specific numbers to share right now. Um, yeah, so I'll just have to leave it at that. Oh, that's, that's absolutely fine. Uh, Chuck, thank you for that. And we'll just mm -hmm. go straight on to the next question. And again, apologies, especially to people who are now sending an even larger number of questions. Uh, we'll try and answer again as many as we can right now. Uh, so one of our uh, members of the audience is asking, uh, are you planning to support uh, Windows platform at all in, in your work and you know in the project going forward? Uh, we do not currently have plans for uh, the Windows platform. Uh, we do have a, a pretty hefty web presence. Uh, we do have a large group of uh, Windows capable developers here. Um, but as I've heard, there is not currently any, any plans for a, a Windows presence as of now. Thank you for that. And uh, we'll just move straight on to the next question again to try and answer in as, many, as many as we can. This might be a question for uh, Tatiana, but also for you, Chuck, obviously, as well. Uh, more on the project management side. So Marv is asking, um, how many projects can a PM realistically be working on simultaneously and effectively so? Uh, I think that depends on the type of project and what it lends itself to. For example, with SCORE, I have a very interesting role because unlike my other projects where I create tasks and dictate priorities and we internally take care of a project and present builds to the client. This presents kind of a monitoring passive role where I'm basically making sure that there aren't a lot of, you know, we don't confront any issues, like I said before, where when things are tense or scheduling or making sure that everyone has tasks and basically being the that extra buffer. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, devs aren't necessarily the best communicators, so sometimes getting on an email and just expressing what's going on uh, is really helpful. I don't know if Chuck feels um, similarly, but um, yeah. yeah, I think it's really dependent on the type of project. You don't want to stretch yourself too thin. Um, I'll go back to Chuck, but uh, just to answer that question, I realized I think at the highest point in my Inaka career, I was managing four projects. Two were kind of intensive, and then uh, for example, one project, if there's one developer, um, it's pretty easy to manage. <laughs> so it depends on the type of project, the type of feature, uh, the different types of technology involved. Is it just front end? Is it just server? I mean, there's a lot of factors. But going into communication, at score. <laughs> yeah, and, and I would just say that it really depends on the expectations of the project manager or, or how many, what they need to do. Uh, if in my opinion, as a kind of an engineering lead and a project management, one large project uh, helps me focus. Uh, it, I think it helps everybody succeed just to do one thing well. So uh, I will take on site projects occasionally, um, but I, I have to remain focused on our, our one goal of uh, an Android and iOS app that uh, engages and in, in, in people love to use. So. Uh, it's hard for me to say from a project manager perspective, but from a, a team lead, it, it's definitely good to have that focus of a single, a single accomplishable, accomplishable goal. Thank you, Tatiana, and uh, thank you, Chuck. That really sort of um, illustrates both the project management side and, as Chuck said, uh, the team lead uh, perspective. Uh, so just to quickly answer one question that has come in, the recording of the webinar and the slides that we've uh, shared with you today will be available for you to collect via the Erlang Solutions' uh, corporate website. Uh, but again, a big apology uh, to everyone. Uh, it's obvious now that we are getting more questions as I speak than we can possibly answer in the remaining time. But we'll just crack on and try and answer as many as we can in the remaining few minutes. Uh, so the next question that tie, ties in nicely with the previous one, uh, 
perhaps for Tatiana. Uh, Tatiana, what percent of percentage of PMing do you see per typical project? So, like I mentioned before, every project's different, and after. Uh, Okay, so every project's different as far as the amount of effort, but um, I think, um, wait, is this in relation to the amount of effort put in, in in terms of hours, or is there any other context to that question? Or I think it's uh, basically trying to illustrate that kind of problem, uh, especially when you're you know planning and putting an estimate uh, together and then considering you know what proportion of PMing will you have in relation to all the other tasks such as development and uh, uh, you know everything else that's involved with delivering a project and, and trying to sort of estimate this uh, you know well in advance and uh, uh, basically make uh, you know organize towards that. So, so I think, I think the, this, oh, the standard that I know is 15 percent so I know that that might be more intensive for certain projects, uh, but that's like the standard. Thank you for that. I, I guess, as you said, it does depend on each project, and you can't sort of generalize. But I guess we can set that as as a as a value to sort of uh, perhaps live by, uh, <laughs> at least uh, at least in approaching a project. Now, the next question, perhaps for Chuck. Uh, Chuck, one of our uh, audience is asking, what DevOps tools did you use in in your project? All of them. <laughs> we really do lots of, um, we have a lot of, uh, we have continuous build integration. So as soon as a developer commits something, it goes through. Uh, we have static analysis to make sure that uh, code that's checked in has, meets our standards. Uh, we have unit tests and functional UI tests. And uh, as far as uh, the build machine we use is a, is a Jenkins-based machine. Um, I guess the, the phrase DevOps can really cover a lot of things. Um, we use multiple analytics platforms. Uh, that That's as far as my brain's letting me go right now. <laughs> Thank you for that. I think that's uh, certainly giving us an idea. Uh, so the next question comes from uh, Agby, if I'm uh, pronouncing that right. Uh, Agby is asking, uh, how was the Mongoose IAM server deployed exactly? Did you use cloud service for the deployment at all? Uh, so our Mongoose IAM is, uh, it is hosted on AWS, but um, we uh, obviously are managing it. Uh, there's not a cloud service that we are using to do that. It's all our own server. Um, so yeah, this is deployed on uh, uh, an AWS uh, instance. And, uh, or a cluster of them. Uh, I think that answers that. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll just move uh, straight on to the, um, the next question. Now here's an interesting one, I guess more from a project management perspective. So Stephen is asking, uh, have you had instances of people effectively going off on a tangent and making development decisions that are not in line with the project plan, but rather pursuing directions that they feel are the right uh, routes to follow from a development perspective? Uh, I'll start off with that one. Uh, no, we have not. Uh, one of the great, uh, one of the strong suits of Anaka uh, is that they're constantly communicating, uh, saying, hey, uh, they will speak up and let me know, I, you know, this part of the code, we really should refactor, or this we should, you know, we should switch to this process. Um, but there's an understanding that, um, they need approval. They need to go through me first because there are expectations for us finishing features, for doing all kinds of things. So we have not had an issue with uh, a rogue dev uh, making something uh, that wasn't requested, either good or bad. Everything has been inside of the project management uh, so far and, and will continue to be. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, Tatiana, did you want to put your perspective uh, towards that? So the question again was, uh, have you ever had instances of people effectively making development decisions on their own and basically pursuing those rules and following a, uh, a particular plan? Um, I think at Inaka, I'm, I'm speaking from uh, different projects, we have a lot of autonomy but also a lot of responsibility to teams. So we 
estimate features and come up with a plan and stick to them. And that plan can change, but it has to be communicated. I don't think I've ever encountered a dev just doing whatever they wanted without communicating to anybody what was going on. Um, but then again, we work with a lot of projects, so uh, that might be um, something that comes up in, you know, homegrown devs. I'm not really sure. Um, Chuck's was talking about Inaka. I don't know if that's ever happened to you with a with a score dev. Uh, yeah, no, uh, no, 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 nothing pops to my head right away. Well, thank you for this, Tatiana. We will have one final question uh, to ask uh, Chuck and Tatiana, and we'll have to sort of leave it at that. But I, uh, well, we do commit to answer all your questions in writing after the webinar. So one last question is, uh, why was C Sharp not used for the client app and for the client XMPP? Um, I guess that's one of our audience members uh, offering an alternative that they feel perhaps would have been a reasonable fit. Uh, that's a good question. We actually started writing our initial app in C Sharp, and uh, we absolutely loved it. It was working in everywhere we want and better. Uh, our biggest problem was uh, being able to um, get all the resources we needed that both knew iOS, Android, and C Sharp. It's kind of a unique mix of talent, and so to find somebody that has all of those and build out a large team, uh, for us it was a little too difficult. So. Um, we uh, lent, uh, kind of leaned on uh, Anaka to help us jump into Swift. And then as far as uh, XMPP on C Sharp, I think it, I am not a server developer, so I cannot speak completely to that, but XMPP is, uh, at least on the server side, is a completely uh, Erlang uh, world, and I cannot uh, speak to it more than that, other than that I'm unsure if there's in a way to do that even with C Sharp on the server. Chuck, thank you for that. Now, we'll have to uh, close off the question session at that, and I'm sure that everyone here will join me in thanking once again uh, Tatiana and Chuck for a fantastic talk. Many thanks to all of you as well who have joined us for the webinar. Please join us again uh, for the next monthly webinar, which we will shortly advertise. Now, following today, we will send you a short survey to make sure we capture your feedback of today's webinar. Uh, as I mentioned before, the recording of the webinar and the presentation that was shared today will be available for you to collect on our corporate website at www.airline-solutions.com. Thank you all once again, and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar.